about 8.30 in the morning. It's pretty gloomy outside here in Toronto, but uh, we're under a stay-at-home order anyway, so I don't think I'd be going outside much today anyway. I think I'm gonna start my day off with a quick workout, and then I got a group meeting, and then I'll get ready to work. So I'll explain more or less how this video is gonna be organized, and I'm gonna be throwing all the time codes up on the screen. At first, I take you through a day in my life a little bit, I show you my group meeting, and through that, I introduce what I do and what we do in my group. But then I get into more of a general talk about what life is as a grad student, what your responsibilities are, your work-life balance, mental health as a grad student. So if you're interested in more of a general talk on what life is like as a grad student, you might want to skip to that timestamp on screen. After that, I keep taking you through my day, I talk a little bit more about my work, I show you some uh, bugs that I'm dealing with in my code, and then at the very end of the video, I bring back more of a general talk and I talk about what productivity is like as a grad student and how, honestly, grad school isn't for everyone, which is something that isn't said enough. And I try to paint grad school in as honest a light as possible. So again, if you're looking for more general advice, feel free to skip to those timestamps on screen. Otherwise, here's a day in my life. Workouts done, shower time, breakfast, and then I got my group meeting. Okay, so I got my breakfast, I'm about to join my group meeting, and then afterwards I will tell you what my plan is for the day. Bye everyone. Bye. Group meeting over. Two guys in our group today were giving practice presentations for a conference that they're gonna be going to next week. For those that don't know, I'm in a group that does computational fluid dynamics, and there are a lot of different things that we do in my group. I, for example, focus on the numerical side of things, so I build the simulations. But other guys in my group do pretty different things. So the first guy that was presenting, he has a project where he's using computational fluid dynamics to optimize the shape of an S duct for boundary layer ingesting engines. And that's basically future technology for airplanes. Our inner velocity is much lower, which means we have lower ramp drag. And so the engine uh, won't need to produce less gross stuff. I'll make a video on that in the future. And the second guy has a really cool project where he's updating our flow solver to be able to handle the transition from laminar flow to turbulent flow. It's pretty straightforward to simulate either laminar flow and turbulent flow, but when you're doing Reynolds average Navier-Stokes, getting that transition point is actually really hard to predict. So he was updating our turbulence model to be able to handle that. And the important takeaway here is on this upper row, we have the smooth transition model and we see it's producing a transition front. Our group is pretty cool because we do so many different things. You have people on the more mathy side like me that are focusing on high order numerical methods and then you have people way on the other end that are super applied that are taking the things that I do for example and actually working on optimizing airplane shapes to make airplanes of the future. It's a pretty diverse group so it's pretty fun week to week to see all the different things. I get to learn about numerical methods in my research but then I also get to see really cool engineering things like designing airplanes. It's pretty awesome. So it's 11.30 now, I think I'm going to do some reading for the next hour and a bit until I take my lunch break. There's this thesis that I'm going through right now by a guy Hendrik Renosha over in Germany and he did a lot of the similar work to what I'm doing my research on. So I've been going through it, it's a really good thesis actually. And then in the afternoon I have a meeting with my supervisor at uh, 3 o'clock and then I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some work on my thesis after that. When you're a grad student, especially in STEM, it's very independent. So I basically make my own schedule every day. I mean, there are certain things that I have to do. So I have to be constantly reading the new papers that come out and stay up to date with what's going on in the field. And I have to do my thesis work, obviously. But really it's up to me when and how to do all that work. If I wanted to, I could choose not to work today at all. As long as I get a certain amount of work done every couple weeks, then it's really up to me. So I have a friend, for example, that's doing a PhD in chemistry over in Switzerland, and he chooses to work ridiculous 15 hour days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, so that every single week he can take off Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and have four day long weekends where he can travel Europe every single week and go to a new country every week. As long as you're putting in roughly the same amount of work that you would be doing in a full time job, essentially, it's really up to you, it's super independent. My supervisor is a very hands-off sort of supervisor. So I basically work independently for roughly two weeks and then every 
two weeks, I have a meeting with my supervisor. I let him know what I've been working on. And he basically gives me some advice. He tells me, I think you should focus more on this, focus more on that. If I have questions about what I'm doing, I can ask him. But otherwise, my research is pretty much entirely driven by me. It's up to me to solve the problems that I'm working on. For the most part, I'm on my own. It's a very independent thing. And that's what grad school teaches you. It's completely different to undergrad in the sense that in undergrad, you're told exactly what you need to know and exactly what you need to do. And you have some strict courses and you have deadlines and projects and you know what to expect. Whereas grad school is you have a project that's given to you, some sort of thesis topic that you have to figure out on your own. It's something that no one's ever done before and you have five years to figure it out. It takes time. Doing a PhD is a marathon, not a sprint. It's about putting in the right amount of work every week so that you get progress done and you're gonna graduate on time, but you also don't wanna burn out and you wanna be in a good, healthy state of mind. A PhD can be really challenging, especially in the early parts of the PhD. I, for one, went through and I'm still going through a lot of imposter syndrome and feeling dumb because it's hard. It's really hard when you come out of undergrad and A, you don't know how to work by yourself, really. And B, you don't know what you need to know in order to solve these problems. I'm working on problems now and I'm expected to find solutions to things that people have been dedicating their entire lives to solving. So it's not surprising that I'm gonna struggle a lot compared to these people. But that's what pushes you to learn. And that's why a master's and a PhD are so good at forming you to think differently. Even the small things, like when I started, it would take me two weeks to get through a paper in the literature. And now I can get through an entire thesis in two days. So anyway, rant concluded. I'm gonna get to some reading, but later on I'll show you guys exactly what I'm working on right now at this moment. Okay, so I finished the chapter of the thesis I was reading. I'm about to take my lunch break, but I thought I would show you guys a little tip that I find really helps me in grad school. So as I read things, or in general anything that I do, I keep notes. I have a LaTeX document that I'm constantly updating because I'm a person that forgets things a lot. So it really helps me to be able to go back and read these things over after. It really helps things sink in. It's hard to remember if you forget something to know which paper to look at exactly. And it's just so much easier to have one place where you can go and look back at everything. So I highly recommend that everyone else does this. It helps me a lot. Okay, what do we got for lunch? I got some uh, leftovers from last night. It's like a quinoa couscous thing. I threw some guacamole on top. I mean, I'm no Gordon Ramsay, but uh, as far as students go, I think I'm pretty damn good. I usually take a break at this point of the day. While I eat lunch, I'll watch Netflix or something. Obviously not gonna show that here, it's a bit boring, but uh, I'll talk to you in a bit. Just before my meeting with my supervisor, I'll explain what I've been working on recently. So I'm about to meet with my supervisor now and I'm gonna pitch him something that I've been working on for the past two weeks. It's aside from my normal thesis work, so I'm not sure what he's gonna say. I'm currently in the process of making a video where I explain my research in more detail. If it's uploaded so far, I'll put the link somewhere. If not, I'm sorry guys, these videos take a long time to edit. In a nutshell though, I work on making simulation algorithms that are stable for the Euler and Navier-Stokes equations. What I mean by stable is that a lot of times when you run a simulation, your code will crash or you have some sort of error that kind of just grows unboundedly and then your simulation is trash. So stability is a property that you want your numerical methods to have. But there are two different kinds of stability. There's linear stability and there's non-linear stability. Linear stability applies for linear equations, like the linear convection equation. Whereas non-linear stability is much harder to achieve and it's for things like the Euler equations or Navier-Stokes equations. And it was always thought that if you had a method that was non-linearly stable, if you linearized it, it would also be linearly stable. But there was a recent paper that came out that showed that linearizing a non-linearly stable scheme actually means it's unstable in a linear sense. 
which is really hard to think about and no one really knows what's going on yet, but it has pretty big implications for things like turbulence because transition to turbulence is dominated by linear analysis. So if you're unstable in a linearized sense, that means that you can have unphysical turbulence. So if you run a simulation, you can have some turbulence showing up that looks like it should be there, but it's actually completely fake and you would never know. So it's a pretty big problem and no one really knows how to fix it right now. And so this isn't directly what my thesis is supposed to be about, but I was reading a paper two weeks ago. They had an idea that didn't exactly fix the problem, but it did make it slightly better. And then when I was reading their paper, I had another idea that would completely fix the problem. Hopefully. Well, I worked it through and the math seemed really promising. I'll show you actually, like I said, everything I do, I, I write down. So I worked through the math a little bit and I, and I came up with this idea, but you'll notice from the title, it says a mostly failed idea to achieve local linear stability. I imagine you can guess from that, that it didn't really work out. I mean, it didn't exactly fail either, but it's just not working out as nicely as I would have hoped. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to pitch it to my supervisor, just see what he thinks. I've only really spent two weeks on it anyway. So if he thinks it's promising, maybe we'll keep it going, but most likely we're just going to kill it. We'll see. Hey, how's it going? Good, how's it going with you? I'm okay, thank you. Did you did you get a chance to look at the document that I sent you? Very quickly, I skimmed it, yeah. Okay, so I'm thinking it might be worth scrapping right from the get-go, but I thought that I would at least show it to you. No harm in that. All right, so uh, take care and I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, okay, see you. See you, Ron. It wasn't quite as negative as I was expecting. He told me not to trash it, but to keep it in the back burner. Who knows? You might hear about this in the future. There's actually a Slack channel going on right now with all the big professors in my field because this problem is a really, really challenging one to solve. So all of the big professors came together and figured, screw it, we've all been trying to figure this out on our own. Maybe if we pool our efforts and come together, we'll figure it out. So I'm gonna toss this idea onto that Slack channel and see what they say. Who knows what'll come of it? We'll see. For now, I need a break though. I need a break. Whenever I can, I try to take breaks doing something productive, like playing the guitar, but you know, it's not always easy because Netflix is so addictive. I'm gonna get back to work now. In our group, we already have our own code set up to solve the Navier-Stokes equations. It's written in Fortran, which although it's parallelized and you can run on a supercomputer and it's really fast, Fortran is really annoying to work with because it's one of the original programming languages. So that's why I'm working on building my own code right now in Python, which although Python is hopelessly slow, it's so much easier to work with and do all my testing. Right now I'm implementing something called grid metrics, which allow you to transform your mesh. So let's say that you're simulating the airflow over a wing. When you're doing simulations, you need some sort of a mesh. So you need to specify the area that your wing is inside. That's the area that you run your simulation on top of. And here the coordinates are physical coordinates. But that really doesn't help us if you're gonna take derivatives. When we're doing things on a computer, having curvy lines is annoying to deal with. So what we do is we do a coordinate transformation. We basically unwrap the mesh so we do a coordinate transformation from X to Psi so that we have computational coordinates that are a lot easier to work with. The computer will see this, but really what's going on is we start off with a wavy mesh and we use a transformation to get us a nice rectilinear mesh. So when we're solving an equation, for example, if you have a conservation law where you need to take a derivative of a flux with respect to the physical coordinates, you gotta think a little bit on how to transform it to make it look like something the computer can work with in rectilinear meshes. And for that, we just use the chain rule. You need to expand the derivative to include this extra term, a metric term. 
You take a derivative now with respect to the rectilinear meshes, but because of the chain rule, you have to include how that mesh actually changes with respect to your physical coordinates. So that's what I'm coding up right now. I'm coding up how to actually compute that metric term. And I have this stupid bug that I've been trying to find for days now, and I can't find it. This is the most annoying part about being a computational scientist. There's always bugs, always bugs. They're everywhere. Life is rough. Time lapse time. I finally did it. I found my bug. It only took me a ridiculous amount of time, but I found it. It was one of those dumbest, this is... The bug was just about the dumbest thing that you can think of. Ooh. I had a variable that I needed to update, but I wanted to keep the old value too. So I signed it a new name, but stupid me forgot to include the copy. And because I didn't include the copy, it was referring to the same variable. And then I was using the old one and the new one at the same time, and it was all getting messed up. <sighs> Well, it's 9.30 and I haven't made dinner yet, so I should probably do that. So I decided since it's so late, I'm gonna make something quick and easy. I'm gonna do chili. I already got the onions and garlic going. Secret ingredient though, peppers from my garden. I grow my own vegetables. <laughs> I'm pretty cool. All finished. And it's only 10.34. Not too bad, here we got my chili. So I wanna make something clear. I made it look today like I'm a machine. Like I'm always productive 24 seven. I work from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. And on the days that I do manage to be productive, I do work like I did today. Especially with programming, I find it so easy sometimes to just get dialed in. I get tunnel vision on what I'm working on. And before I know it, I've been working from 8 a.m. and it's 1 a.m. And honestly, those days are great for me, but I would be lying if I said that that was every day. Remember what I said at the beginning of this video, a PhD is a marathon and you're gonna have your ups and you're gonna have your lows. And when you have those highs, those are huge highs. When things are going your way and you're enjoying your work, it's so enjoyable and you want to be putting 12, 14 hour days because you love what you do. But on the other hand, with grad school, the lows are really low. There are a lot of times when you feel dumb, when you feel stupid things aren't working out and you've been working on the same problem for six months and you have no idea how to progress. I've had those moments where I can't even get off the couch because the anxiety of having so many things to do when things aren't working out and you feel like you'll never accomplish them and you feel like you'll never graduate, it's rough. Now I'm saying this not to scare you off, I'm not saying this for sympathy points, I'm saying this because I feel like it's not said enough about grad school. A lot of people will go into grad school either because they don't know what they want to do yet after their undergrad, so they just figure, the hell of it, I'm gonna try it. Or maybe they're pressured into it from external factors. People need to be aware, grad school can be extremely rewarding. And I'm so happy in my PhD. I absolutely love what I'm doing and I get paid to learn. I get paid to do math. To me, that's insane. I'm so grateful to be where I am. But I have to recognize that it's not always easy and it's not for everyone. And that's okay. So there you go. I just wanted to make sure that I was painting grad school in as honest a light as possible. Today was one of the good days, but remember there are bad days. Anyway, for me, I'm gonna enjoy my dinner tonight. I'll watch a little bit of Netflix. It's already 11 p.m. So maybe I'll do a little bit of work before I go to bed, but I'll probably end up just calling it a night. Feel free to reach out to me in the comments or on our Discord server. Ask me about what I do, about grad school in general. I'm always happy to talk. See you next time, guys.